I'm Effie Parks. Welcome to Once Upon a Jane, the podcast. This is a place I created for us to connect and share the stories of our not so typical lives. Raising kids who are born with rare genetic syndromes and other types of disabilities can feel pretty isolating. What I know for sure is that when we can hear the triumphs and challenges from others who get it, we can find a lot more laughter, a lot more hope, and feel a lot less alone. I believe there are some magical healing powers that can happen for all of us through sharing our stories, and I'll take all the help I can get. Once Upon a Gene is proud to be part of Bloodstream Media. Living in a family affected by rare and chronic illness can be isolating, and sometimes the best medicine is connecting to the voices of people who share your experience. This is why Bloodstream Media produces podcasts, blogs, and other forms of content for patients, families, and clinicians impacted by rare and chronic diseases. Visit bloodstreammedia.com to learn more. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. This is Once Upon a Gene, and I am your host, Effie Parks, and I'm so happy you're here. It's almost Rare Disease Day, okay? Last day of February. I am so excited. Jill and I are going to have the best party ever, and I can't wait to share pictures and videos and all the stuff with you. What are you doing? Please message me and tell me what your plans are in your area or if you're traveling. Uh, speaking of traveling, if you are going to DC for proper rare disease week with like every life or any of them, you need a pin. Okay. And I have some left. Either message me your address, go get on my Google Doc. It's on all of my socials. Put in your address because you need a super sweet Once Upon a Gene pin so you can find all of your Once Upon a Gene or friends and give them a high five and send me a pic. Okay, today's episode probably should have came out a week later because it's their awareness day, but you know, you know how it is. This woman is my good friend. I love her so, so much. I actually got to meet her in person last summer in Boston and got a big hug from her. She's like this little teeny tiny angel of light. And she's doing so much incredible work. She is Mama to Margot, Margot the Brave. Go find her on Instagram. She also writes a lot about her story and infantile spasms and epilepsy. And she's a scientist. Like she's all of the things. And she just will really warm your heart. You heard her back on one of the storytelling episodes, episode 139, Remember Who You Are, make sure you go and take a listen to that because it has a really powerful story that she left with us. Anyways, let's just get into it. I can't wait for you to meet my friend, Madeline Uden. Madeline, welcome to the podcast. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. I know. I feel like I'm hanging out with you again. I got to hug you this summer when I was in Boston and it was the best thing ever. And now here we are. Yeah, it was the best. So glad we got to meet in person. <laughs> Me too. Okay, Madeline, give us a little background about you and your motherhood journey so far and little Margot snap. Yeah, my name is Madeline and I am a scientist. I'm a the Tampo Family Assistant Professor at Tufts University. I started my research lab about five years ago and we work on breast cancer and I've always loved science, love uh, medicine um, and I almost went to medical school, but just decided that I really enjoyed, enjoyed research and wanted to contribute more in that way, but in a way that was, you know, clinically impactful for people. So I felt cancer was a good way to do that. And then um, I had my daughter, Margot, in March 2021, and it was very smooth pregnancy, very smooth birth. I was like, I got this. This is great. Like, I can handle this. And then three months in, she had these face twitches that uh, turned out to be seizures. And initially, we got them controlled, but they, uh, you know, sent out for genetic sequencing. And we got the results uh, when she was five months old that she has two de novo mutations in the SCN8A gene, which is a sodium channel, and that causes epilepsy. And then she started having a lot more seizures, and she's developmentally delayed and has visual impairments. And it kind of started this whole rare disease journey. And she is now almost 21 months old and still has lots of seizures. But she's a very happy little girl. And so been navigating life kind of as a as a scientist, as an academic, as as a rare disease mom, a working mom and, and kind of bringing all that together. Madeline, I can't even believe where you're at now, just in general. But 
with Margot being born in March of 2021. It's really, ugh, it kind of makes me want to cry because I just know all of the things that you've been through in such a short amount of time. And it also makes me feel that way because I'm just so impressed and so proud and like just really adore your outlook and how much progress that you've made under these circumstances. Well, thank you. And I have you to thank for that because when I first got Marco's diagnosis, I started looking for podcasts and I found your podcast. And uh, one of the first episodes I listened to was from Charlie Stewart, who's also a scientist father. And I reached out to you and you wrote back to me right away and I got connected. And I think, you know, both of you really showed me the way that I could that I could do this, that I, you know, could really make an impact in this in this community and yeah, really kind of take advantage of all the things that I knew and that I had accomplished and the people we know to really contribute to the rare disease community. So thank you for showing me the way. Mm. Oh my gosh, thanks for saying that. That's exactly what it's for, right? It's to kind of ignite things sooner than mm -hmm. they have been ignited before for other families. Yep. Okay, I want to talk about your your cancer research because when we were sitting together enjoying an Aperol spritz with Luke Rosen this summer, you were still working in your lab doing cancer and you had no interest in kind of switching over to SCNA day and that you wanted to keep those separate and keep your job life and keep your this. And that changed pretty quickly. And I wonder what was that sort of switch where you decided that you were going to use your gifts to help explore SCNA day? Yeah, I mean, I think it took it took some time to, to get there. But, um, you know, my lab in cancer, we study how cancer cells disseminate throughout the body, the process of metastasis, which is ultimately what leads to patients dying. And, you know, I have to go back where I actually had done my my PhD in neuroscience. So I had worked with the brain and with neurons, but the part that I was working on in neuroscience wasn't as clinically relevant. So I, I had left that field moving to cancer, thinking, you know, that the best way again for me to have an impact was in cancer. But as I was doing cancer research, I was seeing, you know, a lot of similarities between cancer cells and, and cells in the brain with the genes that they have different properties that they have, like their electrical properties. Cancer cells also have electrical properties that we can manipulate that can regulate progression. And then almost 10 years ago now, there were some first scientific publications showing that neurons, nerve cells, even in, in tissues like the breast, can contribute to cancer progression. And so now we have these you know, this kind of new field of cancer neuroscience of, of both the properties that cancer cells have that are similar to neurons and then the neurons that are present in tumors. And so this was something I was really interested in when I started my own lab, but this is kind of a new area and I had a really hard time getting funding for it. And so it was hard to really get into that. But thankfully, uh, last year, I got this uh, big grant from the NIH called this DP2 New Innovator Award to kind of fund this area in, in my lab. And so that just also gave me a lot of flexibility in my research to explore a lot of new areas and to explore this kind of similarities between cancer and neuroscience. So paired with that, and then my daughter's diagnosis, which, you know, happened to, to be in a gene and in a region of a gene that was really relevant to the work I had done in my own lab and then also in my husband's lab. So my lab had just shown that these ion channels of which SCNA day is one of them, and there's also potassium and calcium channels. So we had just published a paper showing that um, ion channels can regulate cancer progression. And then my daughter's mutation happens to be in an ion channel. Like it was just freaky. And then her mutation is in this part of the gene that where there's two versions of it, it's regulated by a process called alternative splicing. And this is something my husband's lab's been working on for 20 years and something that I had also worked on uh, during my postdoc. And so there was just all these kind of really coincidences, fate, I don't know. I'm not religious in any way, but, you know, there's just so much that randomness in, in the fact that Margot's mutation was so relevant to the expertise that I have and that, and that my husband has. And then the last part was that the university where I'm at, Tufts, has a really strong neuroscience department. And they have a lot of epilepsy research going on there. And so I had never really interacted with them. But it also turns out that one of my PhD students at the time was dating another PhD student who was working on epilepsy in one of these labs. And so I got to know more about their research and connected with one of the faculty there. And he's also, you know, was really excited to help us get started into epilepsy research and serve as a collaborator, you know, here in my university to help us get started. And so kind of all these things really came together and made it that, you know, we could 
start doing this research in the lab. And I think the, the last piece is also that there's just a great SCN8A community. So this gene was discovered in mice um, almost 30 years ago now. And the woman who discovered it in Michigan, Miriam Meisler, you know, thought that it would likely be involved in epilepsy because of its properties, but no one had shown it until 2012 when another dad scientist, his daughter had unexplained seizures and, and he took it upon himself to do whole genome sequencing on his whole family and found a mutation in his daughter in SCN8A. And so we have this great research community and they really welcomed us with open arms and have just been really helpful in, in helping us get started and kind of tackle this area of, of this of SCN8A biology that has not really been looked at. And so we're kind of coming in with a fresh direction and different skills. And so, again, that's kind of allowed us to really know that we are contributing, know that we have expertise to provide. And so it's been a bit of a journey to decide that I really wanted to, to do this. But, you know, recently really committed to it and, you know, had a first PhD student start in the lab over the summer. So we are we are going full steam ahead. Oh, my gosh. I love that story from beginning to end and all of those things that were put in your path that you saw, Madeline. I'm not going to say it's meant to be, but like yeah. you paid attention and it's kind of freaky, just like you said. Yes, very freaky. Yeah, you're like, this SCNA community has been so supportive. Uh, yeah, Madeline, they just heard that you, scientist extraordinaire, uh, has their own lab and your daughter has SCNA day and you're brilliant. Of course, they were excited. And it's, it's also very cool to hear just kind of the history of that because not very many of us necessarily have that with our genes. So many have been discovered, you know, within like the last 10 years. So that's really cool. And I love how, you know, that legacy of all of those people working on the gene is just like connecting and now it's connecting so rapidly. It's just so cool. It gives me goosebumps. Yeah, it's an amazing story and community and, and gene. And, and, you know, we've gone to discovering mutations uh, in humans in 2012 and to two clinical trials ongoing now for SCN8A. So the progress really in this community has just been amazing. And, you know, we're so lucky to have them and all the work that they've done. And we're just hoping to really add to that, amplify and, and bring new strategies in that can hopefully help our kids, but also, you know, other rare diseases as well. Yes, absolutely. Speaking of epilepsy, you just came home like five minutes ago from epilepsy conference. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so the SCNA Day community organizes a gathering for clinicians, uh, researchers, and families every year. It's by the Acute Syndrome Foundation, and it's at the American Epilepsy Society meeting. So all these clinicians and researchers are there. And uh, they invited me to present our new research, which was just so exciting to have the opportunity to do that. And because this was kind of a mixed gathering, I decided to invite my husband to join on the stage as well. And also our neurologist was attending the meeting. And so, you know, all three of us were on stage together, the family side, the research side and the clinical side, giving our talk about kind of what we're doing both within our academic labs and then also through uh, the Ann Lorem Foundation that Margot has been accepted in. And so it was just so special to be able to share the stage with, with both of them and share our research and then really have all the families there. There were over 35 families that came from all over the U.S. with children with SCN8A. And, you know, just meeting everyone in real life was, it was amazing. All these people that, you know, I've chatted with on Facebook and, and we've all shared, you know, our highest of highs and, and the lowest of lows and meeting these people and just really feeling like we belong to this community. It was, it was amazing on, on all levels. And uh, it was just, the best, the best weekend. That is so cool. Would you urge families to come who don't necessarily have an organized group yet or feel a little intimidated? What do you have to say to them? Yeah, I mean, I think meeting other people has really made such a difference for me and being able to cope with this. And I really encourage uh, people to try and, and find their people. And, and obviously through these through through like your podcast, it's great to hear, but also even just to meet in person and try and find people in your area and, and meet up with them, even if it's not exactly the same um, disease, but, you know, having just that community of parents that are that are having that have medically complex children. I think in terms of um, gatherings for for different societies, I definitely encourage people to go to these gatherings and often they'll have funding available to help support. And so I know they had that for this one as well. 
so I think those are just really, really valuable in, in getting connected to people and knowing more about the disease. As we know, the families really have so much knowledge, even often more than the clinicians, because we are so rare in each of these diseases. And so that community is everything. So as a scientist, and then later as a rare disease parent, what has the research process taught you? Like, how differently are you looking through that microscope than you were two years ago? I think the first thing that surprised me was really the impact of genetic testing. You know, in cancer, we do sequence a lot of tumors and, and have a lot of information available, but cancer can be driven by so many mutations. It's it's rarely just a single one. And so having that information is, is helpful, but, you know, there's just so much going on. And so when Margot had her first seizures and they were like, okay, we're going to do genetic testing, we were like, okay, but you're not going to find anything useful. <laughs> like, this is not, but sure, why not? Like, go for it. And so when something came back and I realized the impact that that had in terms of, you know, finding a community, finding people that, you know, are used to this diagnosis and who have expertise in, in treating this, in trying to develop mouse models and trying to test it for different drugs. You know, the impact of genetic testing in rare diseases is, is just so important in getting these diagnoses, getting these families connected, and getting the resources that they need. And that's something that I've been doing uh, some work on. We have this uh, core treatment guidelines group for SCNA where we're trying to develop kind of these, you know, consensus on the treatment, the diagnosis, and the treatment of, of SCNA Day as, as, a, as a rare disease. And so this is run by the SCNA Day Alliance, and they have clinicians and, and families that are a part of this. And I'm on the diagnosis part. And just talking from clinicians all over the world, like different countries have different approaches to sequencing. So apparently in, in India, if your kid comes in with seizures, they'll do whole exome sequencing on everyone that comes in right away. Versus like in Japan, they'll only sequence for like one or two genes, apparently. And so in the US, we have more of these panels. So every country is kind of different. But really pushing and for that initial sequencing, doing that, you know, that if, if a child comes in with seizures within within the first year of life, you know, they're not related to a fever, then, you know, doing that genetic uh, testing is is so important and can bring so much information to the to the family. And so that was kind of the, the group that I was in and trying to really push on this consensus to, you know, really have neurologists really focused on doing this genetic testing and how important that can be. And I think I didn't quite realize the impact that that could have. So that was that was the first thing. I think the other thing is, as a scientist, you think, okay, you can come up with a drug and it'll work and we'll stop the seizures. But it's it's not that easy, right? I mean, Margot's tried 11 drugs now and she's still having seizures. And, and it's such a process of just trying and seeing. And then, and I think that's really sad as a scientist to see that, you know, it's just such a struggle to to stop these seizures. And, and you know, as much as we believe in the, in the drugs, they don't always work. And so there's a lot more work that needs to be done on that end. The third thing is that we don't always know how things work. So Margot, for example, is on the ketogenic diet, which has helped her a lot. But like people don't really know how it works for seizures. <laughs> and that just blows my mind. <laughs> like we don't understand, you know, we're giving it to patients and it's working for many. It doesn't work for everyone, but it does work. And there's lots of different hypotheses. And so sometimes, you know, we'll when we were first starting, we'd ask, but how's this going to work? And they're like, we don't know. It could be this way. It could be this way. <laughs> and that was just so mind blowing that, you know, we don't know how this works, but it works for some. So we go for it. So that was just very surprising kind of as, as a scientist from that side. So yeah, those have been some of the, the things that I've experienced. I love that. I bet that's just a crazy maker for a scientist to just like not get that answer or to at least know that the answer doesn't work, that it's just like this weird gray area. Exactly. <laughs> You know, you mentioned Charles Stewart earlier, who's just one of the most special human beings I've ever met. He, like you said, is a dad to two kids who have an undiagnosed rare disorder. And he also worked on the Human Genome Project. But something about Charles that's extra special is how relatable he is and how well he does at explaining all of this stuff in such a way that people can understand it, which is something that you're also really good at. You can come to a level especially just as a mom, and you can help people understand what you're talking about. And I wonder, what is some of the work that you've been doing to help other families, especially in the SCN 8A world, to kind of understand what's going on to help advance progress for this condition? Yeah, it's science communication is something I'm really passionate about, and it's something I've done 
a lot of event like activities, even when I was when I was a postdoc before starting my job and doing outreach and kind of explaining science to young kids or or, um, you know, people who didn't know as much about it. And I even have assignments in my classes where I have my students rewrite a scientific abstract in a lay version. And I have my mom grade it because she's not a scientist. And so <laughs> she gets to grade it and see if she understands it. So I just think it's such an important skill to have. And so since becoming a, a rare mom, I've started a public Instagram account. You can find us at Margo the Brave. And, you know, I try to explain a lot of the science and, and break it down as, you know, what relates to Margo's diagnosis and different things that we've done. You know, like, for example, Margo has two different mutations and we had to figure out if they were on the same chromosome or not. And, and the tests we did for that, you know, how different even medical and diagnostic tests work. So I try to break it down a lot to, you know, make it more accessible for people people to understand. And then within the SCNA Day community, I recently did a webinar uh, with the SCNA Day Alliance, breaking down different treatment strategies that are ongoing for SCNA Day, really breaking down at the DNA level, the RNA level, and the protein level, what different treatment strategies there are, what are the pros and cons, and really explaining kind of what's happening in the field and how different therapies can be used. You know, a lot of time people talk about gene therapy, and that can can mean a lot of different things. And how does that apply to, to SCNA Day and, and different mutations that we have? So that was really great. And we had lots of engagement from families uh, with that. And then I've also been invited to do this again at our European gathering in the spring. So I'm really um, excited to do that. And we've been explaining, so as you know, Margot got accepted into Enlorem, where they're making these custom antisense oligonucleotides. So I also explained, you know, what that process is like and, and what the biology behind that is and what it means for, for these patients. So I think I have really enjoyed doing that and, um, you know, really trying to break it down the science so that the parents can understand better. I know when you mentioned Anne Lorem earlier in our conversation that several parents' ears perked up. So I did want you to kind of go into that a little bit, if you can. How did Margo get accepted? Do you have any advice for people who are reaching out to Anne Lorem? And also, like, what's been happening so far since you got accepted this summer? Yeah, I immediately learned about Enlorem upon Margot's diagnosis, just because of the field that uh, my husband works in. He works in the space of RNA biology, so we found out about it pretty quickly and, you know, decided we wanted to apply for Margot. And so the the process involves applying with your neurologist. And so we did do that with him and uh, we were accepted into the foundation to develop these custom ASO treatments. And so... Right now, they've uh, just completed our whole genome sequencing, and so that is completed, and they're going to start screening for ASOs. So we're still pretty early on in the process, but uh, yeah, we're super excited because this is such a you know cool technology. And in parallel, we're actually doing experiments in my lab on on a mouse and on on mouse cells. So we're also kind of. Uh, uh, testing out uh, different ASOs in, in the mouse cells to see if we can gain some knowledge on that. So we're kind of working on multiple fronts with Enlorem on the human front and in my lab on the mouse front. So exciting. I can't wait to just hear more about this as time goes on. And we're all so grateful to Stan Crook and what he's doing for this rare disease community. It's just, it's unreal. Absolutely. I do want to ask one more question about the accessibility of uh, information to families. And I wondered, like, how do we make this more accessible? Or what would you tell researchers and doctors who are studying these rare diseases and how they can deliver this information to the patient advocacy group, families especially, to help them understand, which will then hopefully get them motivated. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I um, mean, your initiative of of getting the, the genetic counselors connected with the family groups is so important because I think especially when you first get that diagnosis, you're maybe not ready to get all that scientific information right away. And so then it's important to really be able to get all that information from the family groups and in, in pieces where you can digest it. And so, yeah, I think it's so important to have these education um, series. And so both the foundations within the SCNA Day group 
do a great job of that at, at our annual gathering. For example, the first meeting they had was kind of an SCN 8A 101 for families to explain, you know, the basics of, of SCN 8A and what it does and, you know, how how we're trying to, to develop new treatments for it. And then the SCN 8A Alliance also does videos called SCN 8A Unraveled with scientists and clinicians where they kind of break down a new scientific paper in a short kind of YouTube video to be able to hopefully have families listen to it and better understand what's happening. So I think it's something you also have to just take in over time. Like you can't get everything right away and that's okay. And, you know, even as scientists, we're, we're always learning. So it's it's always a, a process over time. And, you know, we've had to really catch up to speed on on SCNA day, but we're, we're still learning ev- every day and every time we hear we hear researchers. So it's okay to not fully understand everything all the time. But I think taking, you know, the time to, to, to understand that and, and having those resources by the foundations is, is so critical. That's a really great reminder. And also just truth that you're a real person and obviously this adorable, smart and motivated mom, but that you're always learning and to take this in little bits and to not get so overwhelmed that you give up and to just try to understand as you go and ask questions and yes. take breaks if you need to. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Madeline, is there anything that I didn't ask you that I should have or anything for the new year that you want to share with any families? Any updates on Margot? Any advice you have for families? I think keep listening to the podcast <laughs> and oh, learning oh, from you. everyone around oh, you. Yeah. You're such a good guest. <laughs> I think, yeah, the the biggest thing for me that's helped me too is, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, connecting with, with other families locally, that's really helped me survive as, as a rare mom and, you know, dealing with all the things that we deal with. And just, I think, understanding that that science does does take time it takes time to understand what's going on it takes time for discoveries to be made and so these aren't things that are, will always happen overnight in terms of new discoveries and new drugs but that every little bit helps every step forward that we make in understanding a particular gene or a disease is so helpful not even just for that gene but for other ones around it and so just keeping moving the research forward supporting that and um, is is just so critical for for all these diseases because we never know what impact it's going to have in the long term and just increasing our knowledge is is so important and so even if it's slow that you know it's important to continue to to do it and have faith in in the science thank you so much madeline and congratulations on all of your hard work and progress so far i just adore you and i know everyone listening can hear your sparkly personality too so give little margo butterfly kisses for me and we'll be in touch and i'm really excited for anyone who doesn't know you yet to listen to this episode so thank you so much for being my guest thanks so much for having me i hope you've been in Enjoying this podcast. If you like what you hear, please share this show with your people and please make sure to rate and review it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also head over to Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to connect with me and stay updated on the show. If you're interested in sharing your story or if you have anything you would like to contribute, please submit it to my website at effieparks.com. Thank you so much for listening to the show and for supporting me along the way. I appreciate y'all so much. I don't know what kind of day you're having, but if you need a little pick-me-up, Ford's got you. (laughs) 